Welcome back to lovely Rio de Janeiro, everybody, for the 2016 Olympics. I'm just kidding. That would be a lot more interesting than what we have to talk about here today. Blood! No, really, welcome back, everybody. I know I have a lot of returning students from our 201 all-day Friday marathon, and so many of you are back on the roster this semester. It humbles me, and I'm very excited to be working with you guys all again. So here we go, the first of a couple of videos to work on the online portion. Here we go. Blood. Chapter 19, the cardiovascular system. We can see here that blood at the very, very high microscopic level this is a false color scanning electron microscopy shows us uh, platelets shown in blue, red blood cells, these little sort of bagel shaped ones, and then the formation of a blood clot fibrin is this yellow string. So blood's a lot more interesting than you might think. Look at all the different functions we see here. Transport of gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients like amino acids, and fatty acids and cholesterol, waste products like urea and bilirubin, all flowing through the blood. It's the highway system of our body, right? Transport of processed molecules as well, like the precursor of vitamin D from the skin to the liver, and then the kidneys, like uh, the fatty acids, triglycerides we get from our diet into LDL cholesterol. These types of transports are happening through the bloodstream. Transport of regulatory molecules like hormones. So uh, the blood is the transport system. There are also things happening within the blood chemically like this, the regulation of pH, a buffering that happens largely because of bicarbonate, and osmosis primarily because of albumin, an important protein in our plasma. And so look at this, blood itself has these inherent or intrinsic ability to maintain homeostasis. This one's a little misleading, number five, maintenance of body temperature. The blood doesn't really do that so much as the cardiovascular system shunting blood to the periphery to cool or to the core to keep us warm when it's cold. Protection against foreign substances, number six, really alludes to white blood cells and their ability to produce these life-saving chemical weapons known as antibodies. And then clot formation. So look at that. Blood does maybe a lot more than you had thought. Here's a really nice infographic. Starting on the left side, we can see that blood makes up about 8% of your total body weight. Of course, that's variable. Uh, kind of gets skewed on the high end as we gain a lot of adipose tissue. But what we see here is what's called a vena puncture, right? This phlebotomist is taking whole blood out of a vein. You can see it's quite dark. And then in our infographic, if that phlebotomist were to centrifuge that whole blood, this is what we would get. We could split apart the liquid and the solid components. The liquid part of blood is called plasma. Of course, it is mostly water, but it has some proteins and some other solutes, nutrients and salts and things. So sort of in a weird way, plasma is like broth, right? Mostly water, protein, and salt. The other portions are what we call the formed elements. These are floating in the liquid plasma in whole blood, uh, but we can spin them out. We see that we have platelets white blood cells and red blood cells. These are the so-called formed elements. Don't worry about memorizing these numbers, although you should be able to put these white blood cells in descending order from their most abundant to least abundant. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils are the types of white blood cells. In our plasma protein, we have three primary classes we'll talk a bit about. Albumins, globulins, and fibrinogen. And then the other solutes include ions, nutrients, waste products, gases, and regulatory substances. Here we can see the plasma proteins. 
plasma is technically a colloid because it's a liquid containing suspended bits that aren't actually uh, you know settling out of the solution uh, the things that are floating in the solution aside from these chemicals the really important ones you should make a flashcard for each of these bolded terms if you don't know what it means it's a good way of learning albumins globulins and fibrinogen are all examples of plasma proteins uh, let's start down here fibrinogen is a blood clotting protein that is in a soluble form sort of dissolved invisible within the plasma you don't know that it's there but you need it to be there because if you have a cut this fibrinogen can change its shape and suddenly become a an insoluble fibrin thread and that's a very important part of the blood clotting process globulins are antibodies uh, but some of them work as transport molecules or hormones and then albumins these are actually the most common or most abundant of our plasma proteins and they are really important in maintaining viscosity blood thickness and osmotic pressure right the tendency of blood to pull fluid from the periphery into the blood it sort of absorbs fluid because of albumin other good definitions if you need to pause to take this all in this would be a good time to do so here's a great summary table 19.1 you should know just about everything on this slide I'm just kidding you should know all of this stuff over here do a little research dig in your book uh, learn about these different globulins and then we'll talk about them in lab alpha globulins beta and gamma globulins uh, you probably know a lot about all of this information right here see what you can do good flashcard resource here put it into your own words put it on a flashcard work with the material people if you just stare at this slide for more than a few minutes your brain goes to sleep you're not learning right that's not how we memorize things we memorize things most efficiently by taking information from this table and then drawing it out talking about it utilizing it putting it on a flashcard making it active that's really the key to deep and comprehensive learning here we go, a little bit more in-depth into the formed elements. Red blood cells are called erythrocytes. White blood cells are called leukocytes. And platelets are called thrombocytes. Each of these formed elements serves its own unique function. Now, why can't we just call them blood cells? Blame the platelet right down here. Thrombocytes are actually cell fragments. And so that's why we have to use this sort of weird, awkward phrase, the formed elements. They are blood cells and these blood cell fragments. Okay, erythrocytes, red blood cells. Biconcave, they're sort of shaped like a bagel. They don't have a nucleus. They contain a very important oxygen-carrying compound called hemoglobin. Uh, and then it transports oxygen, a tiny bit of carbon dioxide, most CO2 is in the plasma. White blood cells are primarily for immunity and allergy, right? We have these two uh, families of white blood cells. We'll see in just a minute. They contain granules or they don't. And then we'll talk about the specific types here in just a minute. This is a great time to pause the video and to use the flashcards that you've made and try to fill in the blanks here. See if you can remember the basic parts of whole blood, and the basic parts of plasma, the formed elements, and then to take it a step further, use the flashcards that you've made so far to build a tabletop version of this diagram. Next, how do we make the formed elements? The production of the formed elements is a process called hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. This occurs in the bone marrow, if you didn't know. Uh, and it is uh, the normal process that happens when it turns abnormal it can lead to blood cancers like lymphoma and leukemia we'll talk a bit more about that 
as it relates to some of these terms. These are so-called stem cells. Did you know that a stem cell is an immature form of a cell that through genetic expression becomes a more specialized form? Great infographic right here showing how those things work. Chemocytoblasts in the placenta and in the fetus begin to differentiate into these lymphoid and myeloid stem cells and in the bone marrow of adults we still find many of these right here differentiating into specific types of white blood cells red blood cells and then platelets coming from the mega karyoblast uh, so what do you need to know here for the test I don't know some of these you know, nitty gritty little ones I don't care so much about, but this big triangle right here, you should know what these are and what they become, and then uh, draw straight lines down from these ones. Proerythroblasts, of course, become uh, red blood cells. Megakaryoblasts become these megakaryocytes, which break apart to form platelets. Myeloblasts become the granulocytes monoblasts become monocytes, lymphoblasts become lymphocytes. So there's a lot of logic to the language, if nothing else. Here's another one of those great summary tables, good flashcard material summarizing what the different types of formed elements do. Let's focus on each of them individually now. Here's the red blood cell. Here's what I mean by a biconcave disc. Now the cool thing about the shape of this cell is that it allows the shell to fold. I meant to make a little animation here, but you'll have to just imagine with me. What if you lifted up these edges? Could you imagine folding this biconcave into something like a little taco shell? or I don't know, I guess it would be more like a toilet seat. The thing is, that allows it to be foldable, so it can fit into really tiny little spaces to deliver oxygen. To all the nooks and crannies within your tissue. The components within this red blood cell are mostly uh, lipids and ATP, but you can see almost a third of the volume is hemoglobin. So each red blood cell can carry, you know, hundreds of millions of molecules of oxygen. As a matter of fact, that's the most important function of a red blood cell, to carry oxygen. Oxygen is bound to hemoglobin to change it into oxyhemoglobin. And as a matter of fact, almost 99% of the oxygen in your blood is here as oxyhemoglobin. A small amount is dissolved in the plasma, sort of like how wave action might dissolve oxygen in the water for fish to breathe. Carbon dioxide is also flowing through our bloodstream, right? After metabolism, CO2 sort of bubbles out of our cells and into our blood, and the vast majority of that carbon dioxide is uh, converted to bicarbonate ions. Some of it's in the hemoglobin, a small amount of it is in the plasma. Uh, here are the other forms of hemoglobin. We talked about oxyhemoglobin when it's deoxygenated, like in the venous blood headed back to the lungs to get recharged. It's deoxyhemoglobin. And when it's transporting carbon dioxide, it's carbaminohemoglobin. Remind me to tell you about carbon monoxide poisoning in lab, and I'll show you how that is uh, also an effect. Hemoglobin is these four globin molecules and four heme molecules. This is where the iron comes in. And of course, when you blend iron and oxygen, you get rust, just like my 2001 Toyota Sienna and your blood. In one of these videos, you can watch them by downloading the PowerPoint. So here's how it works. If our blood oxygen is low, we want to make more blood cells. Remember, blood cell formation is hemopoiesis, red blood cell formation is erythropoiesis, and so it's a bit strange, but the kidney detects low blood oxygen and then releases this chemical, a hormone called EPO. Uh, this is what Lance Armstrong was doping with, by the way, to artificially increase his red blood cell count, but Nevertheless, in normal circumstances, EPO also stimulates bone marrow to produce more red blood cells so that we can increase our blood oxygen. Uh, this process takes some time, and so, for example, 
people who are trying to summit Mount Everest can't just go from base camp up to the peak. They have to spend time so that their red blood cell count slowly rises. Otherwise, uh, they may have a more difficult time summiting. After about 120 days, because these red blood cells have no nucleus, they can't heal. And so after you know about four months, they just fall apart. As they go through the spleen, they rupture. And then these white blood cells begin to chew apart the hemoglobin. Can't have it in the bloodstream, although it's important in the red blood cells. When hemoglobin is in the bloodstream, it's toxic. And so white blood cells begin to chew it apart into its different components. The amino acids are recycled. The heme becomes biliverdin, which is green, which is what stains our bile green. Biliverdin is converted into bilirubin. Now, you probably know this from jaundice, right? People who have liver dysfunction or major uh, red blood cell fracturing uh, lysis, like we might see in a newborn or in an alcoholic, the bilirubin levels rise to form uh, jaundice, right? And that can be toxic. But in normal uh, conditions, the bilirubin is conjugated and then passes out through the bile and into the intestines. So it gives bile its green color and then it's converted into bilirubin derivatives like urobilinogen, which gives urine its yellow color and poo its brown color. This video here on slide 21 helps you to understand that. And then this lovely infographic that I found on the internet really goes into a lot of detail. Uh, and you actually do need to know most of this information here and certainly how it relates to the summary statement. Blood is red, bile is green, urine is yellow, and poo is brown. All because of hemoglobin and their derivatives. Man, if I could make that rhyme, that might be well, I say a nursery rhyme, but a terrible physiological nursery rhyme. Here's another good time to pause the video and reflect on what you just heard about.